Hello and you're very welcome to this episode of the Credo series. Tonight we have Father John Harris who will shine some light on those most significant words of the Creed. He shall come to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom shall have no end. These I suppose are those words that each of us will have to encounter at some point in our lives. In many ways there are those words that mean most to us when we come to the end of our lives. We come to Father John now and ask him, what does this mean for each of us? How does our faith make sense of these words? And where does Christ make sense of them for us? Well, first of all, Brother Ron, I think you're very true what you say. The great question most of us have to face is death. What happens after it? Is there anything beyond it? Hmm. Or is it only this life? And yet I suppose these questions bring us to the very heart of our Christian our, Why do we believe? Mm. Because in what we believe we come to understand reality and the reality is mine. So what happens after we die? Is there something out there or is there nothing? And as you rightly say, we're all going to have to face this question. Now the church teaches us that when we die, we will be judged. And our life will be taken seriously. I think that's the very important point. When our Holy Father, Pope Benedict, wrote his um, encyclical on hope, he brings out a very important notion. He says sometimes people talk about justice and mercy. And he says, you know, some people want to talk only about justice. And he said, that terrifies us. Mm. And he said, other people just want to talk about mercy. And he says, that means our life doesn't matter. God will just somehow or other make it all okay. Regardless of what choices we make. make. Regardless of what we did here in life. And the Pope says, that's not true. God takes us seriously. And the people we are and the choices we make and the decisions we follow in our life, these are real and they do make us to be the people we are. Mm. So he says, at the end, when we die, the person we have become through our actions, through our beliefs, that they make us to be who we are. So we have to take that seriously. Yes, our sins are real. Which of us can face God's justice? And that's why the Pope says, justice is there, the reality of our life is there, but also what's there is mercy. Mm. And God's mercy comes in, takes our reality seriously, and what needs to be saved and justified, he does it through his mercy. It was just the other day I was talking to some man, someone about a professor I had, and I said, you know, he was a very tough examiner, but a very charitable marker. Very important. In you went into the exam, he wanted to know what you studied, how well you understood um, the material. So he gave you ample opportunity to show how well you understood the subject. But then when it came to marking mm. the papers, he always showed a great understanding and mercy. And I think that's what we understand by the final judgment of the Lord, or the personal judgment yes. of each of us. That the Lord will come to us, and we will have to render him an account of our own world and of our own lives. And there will be a meeting between God and each human being at the moment of death. Now that's what we call in the church the, the particular judgment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But there's also what we call the general judgment. And that means at the end of the world, at the end of time, God will sum up the whole of creation and make sense of it all. And again in his encyclical Space Salvi, Pope Benedict XVI writes about that, you know, we almost need a final judgment. We need God to make sense of what our life is all about. And so I don't think, you know, people fear judgment. But that's not the Christian understanding of it. As if we're going to be brought before uh, a, a judge, a courtroom, to be found guilty. The Christian understanding of the final judgment, and in even our own personal judgment, is that God will enter into our reality and make sense of it make sense of all that has happened in our lives, make sense of all the struggles, all the successes, all the failures, all the sins, 
that somehow or other the Lord is going to make it all understandable to us. Mm. And that in some way in the general final judgment, the whole reason behind creation will become known to us. And it's not just me going in for my own private examination and how good or how bad, how did you mark on this, how did you mark on the other, but it's a full understanding of ourselves before God. Now, if we can get that understanding of judgment, I think it gives us a real help in our understanding of how we live here on earth. Yeah, a real clarity as to how we view our, our, our existence here. Well, I think ultimately this yeah. is what we're talking about when we talk about the, the judgment. Mm. He will come again. Who will come? It's Christ. He who died for us on the cross. He is the Lord of history. He will return. He who has saved history and he will judge. Now, he himself talks about in his parables of, you know, the goats on one side and the sheep on the other. Yes, a very strong image there. Very strong image. Mm. And maybe what we don't think about anymore, you know, we sort of done away with this. But I think this is very important for us to remember, for Christians, that the final judgment and the particular judgment are real. Our lives here on earth do matter. How we respond to God's grace now, today, does matter. The choices I make does matter. Mm. If I open myself to God here on earth, I have no reason to fear judgment. However, if I close myself off from God here on earth, I'm already working out my judgment. Because go back to the sheep and the goats. Mm. When was the judgment made? It's not made at the moment when the Lord and Master comes. He says, I was hungry and you gave me food. Yeah. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. In prison and you visited me. It's the life you live yes. here yeah. that judges you. You become the person you are. And I think for many of us in the West now, we think it doesn't matter what sort of life I live. Because somehow or other, if we do believe in the afterlife, God is somehow or other going to do wave a magic wand and make it all okay. Regardless of how we live now. Regardless yeah. of anything. Yeah. And that's why Benedict is against this. He's saying, mm. your life here on earth is serious. The type of person you are now is serious. And you should take your life serious. Yeah. Because God does. And then there are other people who do not believe mm. in the life after death. And how do they fit into the whole picture then, Father John? I mean, <laughs> I suppose you could be funny said to get a rude awakening when they yeah. die, <laughs> but <laughs> that's number one. But I think that deep within us all, we know we are not meant for extinction. Yeah. Every one of us. I do not believe in my heart of hearts that there's a day when I won't be. And I think that's God's plant in us. Yes. Our mm. openness to eternity, our openness to beauty, our openness to the truth. None of us want to be annihilated. And I think that's a good thing. Mm. Now, what the church says, and what our Christian faith tells us, is that longing within the heart of the human person is right. That which we know deep down yeah. is right. Yeah. Because even, say, people who try to take their own lives, I don't think they want to cease to be. They want the pain to stop. Yes. Big difference. Big difference. Yeah, yeah. I don't think any of us wants to embrace extinction. Because the Book of Wisdom tells us God did not make us to become extinct. And I think we all know that deep down. So what the Christian message does, it answers this deep human belief mm. in life. And then for those of us that do believe, where does the church fit in within this heaven, hell, judgment and death? Where does our lives within an active church feed into enabling us to, to, to well, achieve I what I would we're say first and foremost, it's within the church that we meet Christ. Mm. First and foremost through the sacraments, through the life of grace, through our reading of the sacred scriptures. Yeah. So here it is now, this is our arena for meeting Christ. The same Christ that I will meet when I die. It mm. always strikes me, you know, during the Holy Mass, when you go to Holy Communion. Yeah. I always think of that to some extent as a preparation for death for us Christians. Because when we die, Christian belief is communion. Mm. I go to meet Christ. Sure. 
the very same Christ I meet every day at Mass. Yeah. And how I go to receive him in Holy Communion, in some way, is my judgment. Incredible. It's somewhere there it yeah. all is. But we do believe that at the end of time, Christ will come again in glory. And he will sum up the whole story of creation. His kingdom will come at the end of time. A kingdom that's totally unlike anything we know from our political sphere here on earth. This will truly be the reign of God when everything will be made clear to us. I think it's something we should be looking forward to, not something we should be dreading. Yeah. Because I know being Irish, I suppose, when we think <laughs> of judgment, all I can think of is how awful I have been. Yes. How terrible yeah. it is. And the gates of hell looming before my face. Well, I often think, you know, of our blessed Lord, story with St. Peter. The first time our blessed Lord saw St. Peter and he realized that Jesus was so good, he said, depart from me, yeah. for I'm a sinful man. When he meets him after the resurrection, St. John's Gospel, the scene is almost reconstructed there. Mm. They're coming back from fishing. They had caught nothing. Jesus tells them to put the net, nets out on the other side. And then the beloved disciple says, it is the Lord. Yeah. And what does Peter do? He throws himself into his arms of Jesus. Yeah. Now that's what we Christians believe death is. But we throw ourselves into the arms of Jesus most easily when we die, if we do it every day. Yeah. But it's that moment of believing in Christ. Now, the church teaches us also that before the final coming, there will be a great time of trial for the church when people will have to make a very important decision for God or against him. Mm. The scriptures seem to talk about some antichrist coming, someone who will come and deny the reality of Christ, that God has come in the flesh. And you almost get the impression that many will fall away. Yeah. And that this is the final trial of the church. Our blessed Lord says in St. Luke's Gospel, when the Son of Man returns, will he find any faith on earth? Now that's a very important line. Mm. Because this is ultimately what we're talking about. Will one entrust oneself totally to Christ or no? Will one keep to the Gospels? Will one keep to the teachings of the Church? And the Church, in her catechism, warns us. And I think, all right, you can talk about some marvellous big event at the end of time. Mm. Or you can talk about it almost as a person yes, that struggle yeah. every day yeah. for each of us to stay faithful to Christ and to his teachings. And there is, personally, we're working on our own judgment. Yeah. And every age has to come face to face, are they for Christ or against Christ? When you think back during the 1920s and 30s in Europe and the onslaught of communism and fascism, these are two evil um, ideologies. Now, how did people react? Where was Christ? Did they turn Hitler or Stalin into the new God? So I don't think it's something we need to talk about in the far distant future. Mm. It is something that each age has to look at. Yeah. Each political epoch. All right, maybe today we don't have fascism and we don't have... Um, communism but maybe today we do have materialism and secularism, secularism yeah. where is Christ now yeah. what's our new God where is people looking for their salvation are they looking for their salvation in Christ are they looking for their salvation in something which is not Christ mm -hmm. so now is our age to go through uh, the purification to go and to cling only to Christ so why does the judgment help us? I think the judgment helps us to live our lives um, knowing that in the end, this I think we should all get comfort from. Mm. There is, it is, it, it will all make sense. Yeah. And the only one who will make sense is Christ. So we should look forward to our judgment. So ultimately it's a message of hope and certainty for each of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Not something that we should fear. Yeah, fantastic.
That was very interesting. Thanks very much, Father John. We'll be back with you in just a moment after this short break. Hello and welcome back to this episode of the Credo series. We're here with Father John Harris. And if you don't mind, we're going to talk about something maybe not as positive as we, has been, as we have been talking about. The other side of, I suppose we've been talking about God's mercy and love, but there's another side there regards God's judgment and the possibility of hell. Father John. Well, first of all, I'd have to say, Brother Ronan, I don't think we were just talking about God's mercy, right? I do think we're talking about God's justice as well, as he is the one who's going to eventually sum up the whole of creation and sum up the whole of our lives, ultimately in the, our relationship to him. There's a moment in the life of our Blessed Lady, for instance, when she brings the Christ child to the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. The presentation. The, thank you. And Simeon takes the child in his arms and he blesses God. And he says to our Blessed Lady, this child is for the rising and the fall of many in Israel. And then he says to her, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. These very evocative words that he says to Our Lady. Yeah. They're very evocative words. Mm. That almost saying to Mary, you know, you are going to have to choose this Christ or no. You're going to have to follow this child for your own salvation or no. That the secret thoughts of many may be revealed. So what we are talking about in the judgment is how each of us have, has responded to the God within us all. The God who has revealed himself to us. In whatever way he has done this. For us in Christian revelation, he has revealed himself in the truth of Christ and the message of Christ and the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And how I allowed this to interact with my life. And that's why I said earlier on that God takes us seriously. Hmm. Our lives do matter. So I just, I'm not saying it's not just um, a whitewashing away of our sinfulness, not at all, but ours coming to an awareness in the judgment of how we have responded or not to God. Now, I suppose we could call this purgatory, really, that purgative moment. Or, I mean, when we talk about outside of time, time is impossible to speak about. But the purgation, the cleansing of our lives, I suppose the cleansing of our claim to Christ and for Christ, Pope Benedict says in Space Salvi, anything that is not of Christ will be burnt away, and anything that will remain will be totally of Christ. So that's the positive side. Mm. All right, hell. Yeah, I mean, it's something we don't hear about. Hell, of Maybe. course, yeah. is an article of our faith. We believe it's possible, and it always has to be possible. Mm. Otherwise, we're not free. Freedom at its core is the freedom to be for God or against God. That's ultimately what it is. And God wants us to respond to his love freely and truly. He's taken his love for us seriously to such an extent he died for us. He wants us also to take his love for us seriously. And that involves us dying for him mm. in our own lives. But if we fail to and we decide I don't want God in my life and I want to do my own thing and I only want to care for myself. God won't stop us. So deeply does he love us. And that's our freedom. If you go to Dante's understanding of hell, when he goes to hell, it's not a place burning with fire, remember. It's a place cold with ice. Mm. And the devil is stuck in ice, totally preoccupied with himself and no one else. Hell is total isolation. Whereas heaven is total communion. Lovely. And if we go through our whole life being totally isolated, self-centred, taken up only with ourselves, because when our blessed Lord says to the people on his left-hand side at the judgment, I was hungry and you did not feed me, thirsty and you did not give me drink, naked and you did not clothe me, you didn't care about anybody else, only yourself. That's hell. One of the saints has an image of hell which I personally think is very instructive. Hmm. And it's um, a prison, a dark, damp, musty prison. And everybody is in their own cells in the prison. 
and there's no doors in the cells. Mm. Now there is a common area, but no one goes out there. And everyone is in the, in the cell, by himself or herself, with their backs to the door, completely and utterly preoccupied with their own sadness and their own sorrows. Yeah. That's hell. Where you can't see anything beyond yourself. And you can't reach out your hand to anybody else. That's hell. You won't even stretch out your hand to God. And that's what's before us. Either communion or isolation. Mm. Self-centeredness or being totally opened to the goodness of God. Now, for me, that idea of hell brings us to the very sadness of modern Western civilization. Why? So many people, you know, are so preoccupied with themselves, they live in their apartments, locked away. No one says hello. No one asks them how they are. No one cares for them. They live in a living hell. And that's what the church teaches us. That's open. We can do this. God will not force himself on us. There's a moment, you know, in the gospel where our blessed Lord appears on the road to a mouse. Hmm. And he speaks to the two disciples. And very instructively, he listens to what they have to say. So God listens to our story. He journeys with us on the road. He doesn't tell them they're stupid or stop talking. He actually walks with them on their journey of faith. Hmm. Then he opens for them the scriptures. And he presents to them the truth of the gospel. Why it was necessary that the Christ should suffer. And then he comes to a parting in the road. And St. Luke says he meant as if to go on. Yeah. But they invited him to stay with them. Now I suppose that's the judgment. The Lord does walk with us on our journey of life. Yeah. He walks with us on our struggles of faith. He gives us the scriptures. He gives us the teaching church. He gives us himself. Now we can accept that. And turn towards it and have him come into communion with him or we can let him go and walk our own way I suppose sometimes you know we don't like people who disagree with us mm. and we always want everyone to walk with us that sometimes can be our own selves wanting reassurance mm. confirmation I confirmation of ourselves yeah. God has no such insecurity God lets us loves us and if we want to walk away from him and be isolated. And I think this is the heart of it. The faith of the gospel is really an interior openness to God that each human person has in their own lives. Now we are blessed in our faith that we have the gospels and the church and the sacraments to feed us and to guide mm. us and to know that the deepest longing in each human person is real and will be realized in communion with God. How unfortunately, many of us also seem to say that longing, that desire to be loved and understood mm. is irrelevant and our lives are to be nonsensical mm. and we will live for eternity alone. That's hell. So I think, you know, it, what does it say to us now? I think in our world for today, because how we live today will affect our eternal redemption. Sure. It's amazing. We forget that very often. This hope of eternal life is central to the Christian message. Because if it wasn't, as St. Paul says, if Christ has not risen from the dead, he says, our whole life's a waste of time. You know, Christ died on the cross. Christ died a failure, you could say, from a human point of view. And lots of us, if not all of us, die failures. Yeah. Insofar as whatever we're doing stops when we die. Yeah. So is that our life? Is that what it's all about? Our, our Christianity tells us no. That death is not an empty doorway. But it's a doorway that Christ himself has gone through. And as the Pope says in Space Salvi, therefore we don't have to be frightened for the future. Christ is there. He's gone through. So we live our lives either open to God and to the truth of God or we cut ourselves off by our decisions, by our way of life we make ourselves the centre of the universe mm. or we make God and that's the great challenge for every human being it's the ultimate choice that dominates each and, our, each and every one of our lives 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And the Christian message gives us an answer. Yeah. Is my life here on earth, does it mean anything? Do I mean anything? Or am I just a, a conglomerate of cells? Or a conglomerate of um, desires? Which are all ultimately to end in confusion. And the church says no. And Christ says no. Our life does have meaning. Our life does have an ultimate reality, mm. which is communion, not isolation. And I think that's the great gift we can offer the world. That's the great beauty of the Gospels. Mm. That everything that is truly good in the human person will triumph in the end. Can triumph in the end, if we're open to Christ. And I suppose it's our life in the church that enables us to make that choice to choose for Christ and choose for life. It is, and it makes it easy yeah. in the sense of the Christ's grace. Yeah. That if I know the love of Christ, and if I really understand how much he loves me, and I respond to that, yeah. that changes my life. Sure. And I think so often, you know, um, people talk about, you know, if I'm really good, God will love me. Yeah. That's wrong. Yeah. God loves me, and because he loves me, I live a certain way of life. Okay. I'm good not because, God loves me not because I'm good. God loves me, and therefore I do good things. Yeah. So if we get that message clear in our own heart, and that, that Jesus will come at the end of time, and all that we believe in the Gospels will be seen by the whole of creation to be true, in the end of the day, the gospel will be seen to be true. And we need that because you look around us, you know, mm. and you think, am I stupid for believing? Am I stupid for trying to be good, trying to live a good and holy life? When all these people around about, we don't seem to be trying to live good and holy lives and sure. they're getting on quite well. Yeah. And I suppose we kind of times think, you know, does it all make sense? I think it makes sense in two levels. I think it makes sense in this world because even now when we live with the life and presence of Christ our life takes on a whole new wonderfully good way of being mm. there is happiness and there is joy and ultimately the happiness and joy come to its fruition in heaven but I think the hope that we have also helps us to get through life as the Pope said, it's not just informative, it's transformative. Yes, if you yes. have hope, you live differently yeah. from someone who has no hope. Because sometimes you can look around and say, my God, does any of this make sense? When it happens like that, I often think of our Blessed Lady at the foot of the cross. And there was her son dying. And there she held his body dead. It must have looked as if everything was a waste of time. Yeah. Nothing makes sense. And it didn't, yeah. from where she was standing at that moment. But in the light of the resurrection, everything takes forward a new hope. And on that central, hopeful message of our faith, I say thank you very much, Father John, and thank you very much on this episode of the Creed series, that we may see you again sometime soon. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>